just letting everyone know that this is a recorded meeting. So if you would like to stay on camera, that's totally fine. Otherwise, you can shut it off. But welcome to the Bay Area Science Festival. The workshop that we're going to be holding right now is presented by the Makers Lab at UCSF. So let's get started. Again, this is the Makers Lab, and I'd like to welcome you to this fun workshop that we're going to go over some silicone casting today. The Makers Lab is the library's maker space. It is a creative DIY space where the UCSF community can gather to make, innovate, and tinker using 3D printers, software, VR, programmable electronics, craft and hardware supplies, and much more. You can learn more by checking out this URL, tiny.ucsf.edu slash makers lab. And you can also follow us on social media at UCSF Makers Lab. My name is Scott Drapeau, and I am the designer at the Makers Lab, located in the library at UCSF. I am in my final three weeks of a master's program in product design at San Francisco State University, Go Gators, where I will be graduating with high honors. I am thankfully fortunate enough to have landed a job as a designer while studying design at such a wonderful and supportive place. If you are interested in touring this wonderful place, our lab, you are welcome to do so at the following link, which should be available in the chat. If you have any questions, please enter them in the Q&A, where the Makers Lab Manager, Dylan Romero, will be monitoring. He is also on this Zoom meeting. I will also try my best to address relevant questions as they come up but I might be a little sidetracked with uh, the workshop stuff. So what is modeling and what is 3D printing? Here is a time-lapse of an ear being reverse engineered into a mold and the printing of that mold for casting an ear. The reason why we are making an ear today is because a previous student at UCSF wanted to create low cost prosthetic ears for people that might have bo uh, been born without ears or experienced trauma to their ears. I use Blender more often than not to make these molds. Though Blender is open source and free, it is an extremely powerful program for modeling, animation, and rendering. The creation of a 3D object is achieved using an additive process. And that's what we're seeing on the right side there. Here you can see an object is created by printing layers upon layers of material until the object is created. Each of these layers can be seen as a thinly sliced cross section of the object. The red material you can see here is called TPU which is a flexible filament that works well for making molds. More on this in the activity. I'd like to do a quick poll right now about who in this workshop has 3D printed. So if you could please respond to this poll. Okay, the majority of people, 78% said no, uh, while 22, 21% of you said yes. So it sounds like we have some experienced people in this group. And if you'd like to provide in the chat your coolest print so far, you can type it in there and let us know what that was. I'll give you a minute just to do that if you want to. You don't have to let me know what you printed, but if you have some favorite print that you've made in the past, please go ahead and type it in to the chat. Oh, something, Danica, you're actually holding it up. What is that? Is that a little butterfly? Little case? Oh, nice, heart case. That's so cool. Awesome. 
Nice. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, if you have your 3D print right next to you on your desk, you can also show it to us. That's that's awesome. So here are the results from the poll. Let me take a look there. All right, I'm going to stop sharing that. And we're going to move on to our activity. So I'm going to switch my camera over to my tabletop and talk about the things that I have on my desk here. If you can see, please give me a thumbs up. See some stuff on my desktop. All right, great. Thank you for letting me know that. It's very important. And let's talk about what this stuff is. So some stuff that you probably already know. A spoon and a fork. What am I going to use this for? I'm not going to be eating today. I'm going to use these because, well, I already had them. And I'm going to use these to stir up my silicone today. So I just grabbed any utensil that I have handy, and I put them on my tabletop. Today, I'm going to be using this kind of silicone. It's called Skin Tight, and it's made by a company called Smooth On. Smooth On is, I'd say, the leader in making silicone. And this silicone specifically is a platinum silicone, which means it doesn't really have platinum in it. Maybe it does, I'm not sure, but it just means you don't have to degas it. That means you don't have to get rid of the bubbles in the silicone when you mix it. The bubbles will just pop out of the silicone as you cure the silicone. This is a very flexible, easy to use silicone. And I also wanna talk about what shelf life and pot life is as I work on the mixing portion of my silicone. So I'm going to return back to some vocabulary specific to the silicone as we get into it. I also have something called a universal mold release. And this is a spray that I have already applied to my mold that I'm going to be filling up with silicone. This is similar to like when you're cooking and you put oil or butter on your pan or use the PAM spray to make sure that you don't stick to your cooking utensil or device. It's the same idea. So this is a mold release specific for silicones and uh, similar rubber products. So I have taken my mold release and already prepared my mold. So this thing here is the inversion of the ear. It's basically the negative of the ear. So I've sprayed my uh, universal mold release inside of this mold and I let it dry for about 30 minutes. And that creates a nice non-stick layer inside. It's invisible and it doesn't transfer over to my cured product when it's done. But here's my mold that I was printing in the previous slide. You know what these are? They're just cups. I cut them smaller so you can see and they're less cumbersome. And right here are silicone pigments, also called silk pig, also from Smooth On. And there are different colors. I'm going to use brown. This one's called pig, actually. And then this one's called white. I might not use white today. But these are silicone pigments. When you're working with silicone, you have to use silicone pigments, or else you won't be able to mix your pigments correctly. I've tried it and I failed in the past. So learn from my mistakes and use the stuff that you're supposed to use. So again, silicone pigments for silicone. Now you're seeing a yellow jar and a blue jar. That means we have a part A and a part B. And how we mix these is a one-to-one -one ratio. So equal parts A to equal parts B is going to be used when we mix our silicones. So I'm gonna make a little space here move my release agent because I've already used that. And I'm not going to be using white, so I'll take this out of the picture. And I'm just going to focus on right now these cups and measuring out how much silicone I need. I'm going to take my A and pour this an even amount of A into my first cup. And I am measuring this exactly. I'm using the built-in lines of the cup. This is just a standard silo cup. And I know you can't see it from the side, but you can trust me when I say that I am measuring exactly how much silicone I actually need. And that is poured in there, just like so. Now it's very important. You might see I'm wearing gloves and you can see they're already starting to get a little goopy. Silicone is not the cleanest 
product in the world to work with. So I do recommend that you always have some rubber gloves on. I've measured out my A. I'm gonna keep that on the left side just so I don't get confused. And now I'm going to measure out my part B. All right, and so I'm pouring out the same exact amount. I'm using the line that is inside my silo cup as an exact measurement. And I've casted this ear before, so I already have a, a good understanding of how much silicone I actually need in the end, but that's gonna be good. All right, these A and B cups of silicone, will not do anything just like this. They're gonna stay exactly like this, nice and viscous and runny and goopy. Once I mix them, you're gonna have a reaction. The silicone will start to harden, it's called a catalyst. So we have our non-catalyst and our catalyst. And once you mix, they turn into a, a rubber of sorts. So the good thing about this is that I have flexibility. I can work on this and not worry about time. But once I mix, we have something called pot life. And that is the time that it takes from the catalyst to start to react and harden up your silicone. And for this silicone, I have three minutes to do my stuff. That's not a lot of time. So what I'm gonna do is focus just on my A and pre-mix my pigments that I want in order to tint up my silicone the way that I want it to be. So I'm gonna take a little bit of brown And you only need a very little amount. You can see it's barely any on there and that's gonna really go a long way. So I'll take that, put that aside and I'll mix that with A. And that's gonna get pretty dark pretty fast and it looks delicious like a chocolate sauce, but I want it to be a little lighter than this. So I will get another hue. In this case, it's called pig. And I'll get that, just a smidgen of that. And I'll add that to my already pretty chocolatey tint there. And you can see it starts to lighten things up just a little bit. But what I want you to do is avoid any streaks. Right now it's not evenly colored. So we wanna have no streaks. We wanna have a nice even consistency all the way around. And again, I'm just working with one of the parts. It doesn't matter if I'm using part A or B, as long as I'm using it by itself on its own. You don't wanna go mixing your pigments after you've already mixed both your A and B. That would be not good. So here we are with our main color. And it's gonna thin out just a little bit once we start adding our B into that cup. But basically, as soon as I start pouring, I have to count down in my head. I have three minutes before it's gonna start gooping up on me, getting a little rubbery. So I will pour this in here. And I'm thinking about this premeditated, pour in here, then pour into my mold. So I have it right next to me, ready to go. And I don't need my pigment anymore. So I will pour in here, pour in there. Pretty straightforward, but time is of the essence. So here we go. So I will pour my B, scrape it out, and it's okay, I can contaminate this now with the same spoon that I was using to mix earlier. I'm not too worried about it because I'm gonna mix up everything anyway. So here we have, it's kind of streaky, but we need to make it so it's nice and smooth, all same color. And that's looking good. I don't see streaks in there. I'm getting all of the corners at the bottom of my cup. And that looks fantastic. So I've already killed one minute. Oh goodness, I only have two more to go before I run out of time. Luckily for me, this is a nice small cast. So it's not gonna take up too much time. So I'm at like a minute and a half now, keeping track of myself. And then I simply just pour this in and let it do its thing. Use the spoon and I'm using a nice slow pour. I'm getting it all in there. 
And this is just a level casting, which means I'm relying on gravity to set everything into place. And you can kind of watch, there are little bubbles that are forming at the top and they're popping. And that's exactly what we want to have. We don't want to have any bubbles inside of our cast. We want it to go away. So we let this sit and we let this cure. But there's a couple of things I want to bring up. I talked about the pot life. It's three minutes. So this is starting to get already a little hard. But let's talk about shelf life. Shelf life is basically the same as like your expiration date on your food products. Silicone does have a shelf life. I'm not talking about mixed. I'm talking about unmixed. You bought it brand new. You've never opened it. You have anywhere between a few months to maybe a couple of years of shelf life, depending on the manufacturer, the blend, the chemistry that's inside of your jars. So when you buy silicone, check the shelf life, check when it was manufactured if you can, and you do have a uh, time before it will expire. Silicone can be used for doing things like this, making these kind of low cost prosthetics, but you can also see this used in movies and stage product, uh, production, special effects, stuff like that, and medical simulators, which is a lot of the stuff I do at UCSF is medical simulation devices made out of rubbery products such as silicone. All right, well, that is nearly done curing. So I'm gonna do a little bit of demolding now. So I'm taking off my gloves because it should be uh, dry or getting cured and, and ready to go. And I did do this prior just so I could have one done and ready to go. So this is a fully cured version of the same thing. And you're supposed to really let this cure for about 15 to 20 minutes. And I don't want to waste your time because time is valuable. So I did this earlier today just to have this ready. Now, the demolding process is not that hard, but you do have to be careful, especially with something like an ear that has such intricate folds and bumps and an organic shape that's maybe going to get uh, damaged when you demold it. So here's the process of how I like to demold things. And I'm just checking my clock real quick. I'm looking good. All right. So what I do is I go around and I start to lift up just all around with the, the uh, tip of my finger, all of the edges of the cast. And I'm pushing down and I'm kind of wiggling it. And I'm being super careful right now. Usually you can use a little bit more force, but I want this to be nice and smooth and careful and concise. And so here we are just prying this corner here and here and here. And then I'll start to move in towards the hole. This is actually the ear hole. So the mold, how I made it, is it retains that hole as you do your thing. So I'm just pressing and loosening that up. And now I'm going to start with the easiest part of the ear and demold that and kind of peel it this way and then try to get that bottom lobe after. So I'll kind of press down and loosen it even more. Silicone is a very strong product and can take a lot of push and pull and force, but just like skin, it can rip, it can tear. So you gotta be careful. And why am I using TPU, this uh, flexible filament? Well, this allows me to actually bend the mold as I'm demolding it. So I can bend this almost like a stiff rubber and really get my fingers in a little bit more. If I printed this with a hard plastic, I would be taking a hammer to it and breaking it but this is a flexible filament that I can actually squeeze and move around and really get the model to come out. So I got that part out there, wonderful. And you can already see how it's transferred all of those nice details that you're supposed to see on an ear. So it's looking good. And you wanna go nice and slow because there's lots of folds in the ear. And then this is the hardest part down here, the, the lobe. I think this is the lobe, <laughs> the part where you get your ears pierced usually. And that's the trickiest part. So I'll do this side next. There it is. 
starting to come along. I can feel it's gripping, it's pulling, but it's also releasing at the same time. And that's why you use the universal release agent. Oh, nice, just popped right out. And there we have a nice transfer. I'd say it's a low fidelity version, but it is a good transfer of a mold into a cast. And this one I could demold in about 10 or 15 minutes or so. All right, so I have a question for all of you. I'm gonna switch back to my presentation and I'd like to shoot up another poll. What type of pigment works with silicone? Let's see if you were paying attention to this one. You have your choices, alcohol-based, watercolor, or silicone or oil. Hmm. Let's see if we can get some responses here. Okay. I see them coming in on my side. I will share the results once they're all done. Well, I got a good question in the chat here from Danica. How would you attach the ear to someone's head? Well, there are different ways you can mix silicone in that you can make it extremely tacky or you can make it really dry. And so what ways we've implemented these kind of mock products, as in they're not really used, they're more of prototype products, we've mixed A and B differently. So instead of doing a one-to-one -one ratio, maybe we do a two-to-one or a one-to-two. And experimenting with that kind of chemistry will yield sticky silicone that will remain sticky for its life. Another question is, do you keep it that color or do you paint dye it? Well, the color was more of like a, a clear color. And I added the pigment called silk pig or silicone pigment made by SmoothOn? Great question. All right, well, I see the poll is done and I'd like to end the poll and share the results with y'all. 50% of you said silicone, which is correct. Yes, the majority of you said that. And other guesses, alcohol-based, watercolor, and oil. Unfortunately, these colors will not mix as well. Yeah, they can mix, but they might be streaky. And I don't think you're going to have some good success doing that. So please use silicone pigments when you're mixing and coloring up your silicone. Can you hear through the ears? Another question that we got in. Wow, great question. And I've had that question before. I'm going to exit out the poll. The ear works by bouncing wavelengths off of different surfaces and then going into your ear canal. So yeah, a prosthetic ear can work the same way uh, an ear that grows on your head works, but a person may have to learn how to use that ear, as in they might not understand the direction from which a wavelength is traveling through the air. And so as time goes on, they can learn how to use their ear if they didn't have one before, or if they change their ear shape. I can't answer too much medical stuff, but that one I know from research. So <laughs> great question. All right, now I wanted to check in. I'm going to probably do a quick, uh, what we make slide in the maker's lab. Dylan, do you think we have time for that? All right, sounds good. All right, so what do we make in the maker's lab? Or what do people make in the maker's lab? I help a lot of people make these things and I just wanna go around and tell you what these are. Number one is a rheumatology project, a phantom, where people are able to open up and aspirate the glenohumeral joint, which is located in the shoulder. The glenohumeral joint is, think of it as a silicone ball filled with liquid inside of your shoulder joint. And what we're looking at is kind of the muscular formation that is around your shoulder under the skin. So this is a skinless and halved model. And those white things inside are just 3D printed bones and some foam as a spacer. 
Now, number two is a baby rib cage phantom used for extracting fluid between the ribs and the lungs for babies that have uh, a problem when they're born. And so a chest tube is actually inserted through the skin, which is the flesh color here. And then it needs to stop. The tube itself has to stop before it hits the lung. So pictured here is all three components, the outer skin, the ribs themselves made with resin, and then the lung, which is silicone. The skin and the lung are both silicone, but they're different types of silicone and different pigments were used. And number three here is a spine and it's floating in a sense in this clear gel. It's a humimic gel, I believe. And humimic gel is actually an imageable gel. So you could put this under ultrasound and see this spine, similar to how you would see it inside the human body. And then number four here is a cleft lip phantom for a baby so that doctors can practice suturing the cleft lip in order to repair the face. So these are the kinds of fun projects we get to help people make at the Makers Lab here at UCSF. And lastly, I'd like to open it up for Q&A, ask us anything in the chat, but also you can email us at makerslab at ucsf.edu if you don't have any questions now or you wanna ask us later. You can learn more about us at library.ucsf.edu slash use slash makers lab. And feel free to follow us on social media, UCSF Makers Lab. So I'm here for questions, let me know. You've all been a fantastic audience. You've already asked great questions. You've attended to the poll questions, yay. It's always fun stuff. Dylan, if you wanted to add anything, you're welcome to do so as well. All right. Thank you, Danica. Yes, this session is being recorded. I don't know where it will be available. Dylan, could you help us out with that question? Yeah, it should be posted on the Bay Area Science Festival's YouTube channel. Wonderful, thanks. Thank you, Kamala, appreciate it. All right, well, that was the uh, period of silence that we can go through until uh, about to wrap things up. So I'd like to say thank you. Thank you, uh, Sadie and, and Isabella. 3D printing is so cool. And I hope that you are able to take something away from this workshop today and apply it to your projects in the future. And let us know if you have any questions or need some help with anything. Thank you, everyone.